Let me get into present mode here. All right. Thanks for that introduction, Kendra. And uh, I'm so glad to hear all these things about myself. That's very nice. Now, a garden in five parts. I didn't set out to uh, do a garden in five parts. I, I really just started in the early 90s. Uh, well, when we moved into this particular house in 89, about the only thing we had in the way of uh, landscaping was partially dead lawn in the front and a whole lot of vinca minor in the back. And so the, the lawn was fairly easy to get rid of. Um, at least it seemed that way at the time. And vinca took a little bit more work. But I just started planting more or less at random. I didn't have any sort of design in mind. I just bought plants that I liked and put them wherever I thought I might like them. And as a result, uh, a lot of plants were sacrificed in the process, but I also learned from that. Uh, during that time, there was a lot of weeding that needed to be done. Weeds keep coming in from everywhere, uh, but it just takes constant work to get rid of them. I have no irrigation system, so I rely on rain and a little bit of hand watering. And as Kendra said, in 2012, I kind of overhauled everything based on uh, just kind of what plants I had and where they were located. And so that led to the five thematic zones. So I'm going to launch right into them now. First, the Baja zone. That's in the front of the house. And uh, this has one of the first plants that I ever bought. I think I bought this one maybe in uh, 91. There used to be a native plant nursery in Encinitas that was run by the late Janine DeHart. And she had a lot of really interesting different plants including this one, the Baja California Spurge, Euphorbia Zanti. And um, I had no idea at the time that I bought it how big it was gonna get. This is uh, now about 12 feet tall. And uh, because of, of, I bought it in around 91, then it's around 30 years old now. And it does have to be trimmed back quite a bit to keep it from getting overly large, but it does have in the springtime, like right now, really great flowers, they're tiny, they're kind of typical euphorbia flowers, um, but there's so many of them, there are thousands of them covering the top of the plant. So uh, it's really a visual spectacle when it's going. Another euphorbia that I have is a very different stature or habit. That's the cliff spurge, euphorbia misera, which tends to be more sprawling. And uh, in my experience, it stays pretty contained, but it has very, very similar flowers as you can see on the screen here. Uh, this is one that grows, just it just barely comes across the border into the United States. There's not a lot of it in the US, but quite a bit of it just south of the border. The previous one is found, uh, the Euphorbia zanti is found only in Mexico. Shah's agave is, is a really a standard of Baja. Anytime you go south of, uh, uh, Tijuana or into the Ensenada area, you start seeing it all over the hillsides. And uh, it, it is one of my favorite plants. You're going to hear me say that a lot. Uh, but I have to warn you, if you're thinking about planting this one, think carefully about your, where you're going to put it and uh, how you're going to take care of it. Because the tips of the leaves are very, very sharp, hard spines. And I trim all of mine off just so that I can work around it. It's, it's nearly impossible to weed around this plant. And you also don't want to put it right alongside a, a walkway where it's going to jab people. But it's a really great plant. And mine have, uh, have never bloomed, even though they're approaching 30 years old. But they're still not mature enough to bloom. I'm looking forward to that one day. And once they do, this agave, like all agaves, is going to die. The, the mother plant is going to die. But it does put out a lot of pups on the side. So I'll continue to have Shah's agave after that. Here's an uh, unusual one that I got from uh, Tree of Life Nursery a few years ago, Baja Tree Verbena, Barosia fastigiata. And I must say, I didn't really know how tall this was gonna get. I thought it might be a shrub that would get up about the height of the fence, but it kept going and going. And you can see that I have pruned it a lot to open up underneath because I have a nolina under there and some other plants and I don't want them to be too shaded. The 
standout thing about Baja tree verbena is these clusters of flowers that look a little bit like lantana. Um, I think they're really great flowers and they seem to attract a lot of insect life. Here are a couple that uh, are pretty well known, Baja Fairy Duster or Caliandra Californica. That one seems to bloom almost all the time. Um, there's hardly any point in the year when it doesn't have some flowers on it. And the Cardone Cactus, Pachycereus pringali, um, is a very slow growing columnar cactus. This one uh, on the right is um, about 15 years old, I would guess, and it's about a foot tall. So this is not a cactus that you're, you're going to see it grow to full size in your lifetime, but it's a very nice cactus. And as an example of, of Baja, it's, uh, well, it's just a, a trademark of Baja cacti. Now Baja also has quite a few elephant tree species. Most of them are in the genus Bursera, but this one is different. It's in the genus Pachycormus, Pachycormus discolor. And, uh, and that puts it, that genus puts it into the family, uh, the Anacardaceae, which is a family that has cashews and poison oak and some other things in it. So it's a really interesting family. Uh, it gets to be huge and that's why I have it in a container because I don't have room for another huge tree. It has very nice dainty little pink flowers in the summer. The hedgehog cactus is uh, another one that is really found only in Baja. Maybe at some point in the past, we used to have hedgehog cactus in Southern California, but uh, you know the way we've treated the coast over the last hundred years, uh, there's none of that left. So this is something that you'll only find if you travel along the beaches south of Tijuana into the Ensenada and Punta Banda area. It's a very typical, um, bluff top dweller there and has very nice yellow flowers. And there are some other species to other species of hedgehog cactus that grow down there with other colored flowers. There's really a, a lot, uh, if you're gonna get into this, a lot of choices there. This is a really unusual Dudleya, uh, Dudleya pachyphytum that is found only on Cedros Island. And uh, if any of you have ever heard uh, John Redman speak about uh, Cedros Island, uh, then you'd know that at one point, or for not a, a point, but for a long period of time, the whole island was grazed by goats and, and other feral animals, and almost all the native vegetation was lost for a time. But many of these Dudleys and some others hung on in the cliffs where the goats couldn't get to. So this is a great example of of uh, one of those survivors from Cedros Island. And I've never been to Cedros Island, but one of my goals is to go there someday and see this one growing in the wild. My favorite Dudleya now is this one, Dudleya candida, which comes from the Coronados Islands that are just right offshore from Tijuana. They're almost San Diego Islands. You can see them from uh, like the Coronado Bridge and places like that. Um, it's a very compact, uh, nice, well-behaved Dudleya. Well, they're all well-behaved, but I just especially like this one with its short little leaves and, and very nice geometric form. Uh, another thing I want to point out here is the photo on the right shows this big rock, and, and that's there because I wanted to mention that I've had some of these rocks long enough that they've started growing lichens on them now. And so I'm really excited about having a native lichen garden along with my native plants. Now moving on to the oak woodland chaparral section. So we, Baja section was number one, this is number two. And this section, it's kind of a misnomer to call it oak woodland because I really only have one oak tree, a coast live oak. And one oak tree does not make an oak woodland, but it's the best I can do. This one tree already is trying to take over the entire front yard. And uh, that is the tree in the center of this photo. On the left is a uh, lemonade berry, Rus integrifolia. And on the right is a, an elderberry, Sambucus cerulea. Uh, the Sambucus is another one of those plants, one of the earliest ones that I bought. 
it got to be a very large tree and it started competing with the oak and I wanted the oak to win. So I cut down the elderberry uh, and it came back and I cut it down again and it came back again. So I finally decided to uh, let it grow somewhat, but I cut it back every year after it drops its leaves. It's a deciduous tree. So as soon as it drops all its leaves and fruit, then I cut it back again, and then it comes back the following spring. So this view of my oak, so-called oak woodland is not my favorite. This is my favorite view. This is where I've tried to create uh, an oak woodland understory with miner's lettuce, claytonia, perfoliata, um, hummingbird sage, and some dudleyas and some other things in there. So to me, this is the, the important part of the oak woodland, not so much to the tree itself, although the tree is very important, but the understory is what I really get excited about. Uh, there's the hummingbird sage again, a, a more of a close up on that. And uh, one of the things that I get the most excited about is the little wildlife that I get in my garden, typically small vertebrates or invertebrates, like this slender salamander that I found just from, sometimes I'll just be picking up some leaf litter and there will be something like this underneath there. Now, I wanna just make a, a brief mention here about mulch because the trees that I have do produce a lot of leaf mulch. So on the left is the oak leaf mulch and on the right is uh, from a, um, an island uh, ironwood. And uh, the, the, I'll be talking about that one later. But that's my philosophy to, uh, about mulch is to use the leaf litter that the plants produce. When I first started gardening, I did buy mulch or get it from various other places. But now uh, after 20, 25 years, the plants are producing enough mulch that I don't need anything but that. Uh, another thing about mulch is I don't like to have it too heavy, too thick, because I have a lot of annuals and I want them to be able to come up through it. Okay, now here's another member of that, the chaparral community. We're into chaparral plants now, and this is Mojave yucca. And I want to say a few words on behalf of Mojave yucca, as opposed to Whipple's yucca or chaparral yucca. Um, those are the two yucca species that we have. And chaparral yucca is very nice. It's a great looking plant, but it takes a long time for it to flower. And when it does flower, it dies like the agaves do. Uh, Mojave yucca, which is a misnomer, is yucca shadigura, is a great plant because it doesn't die after blooming. And, and this one, which I've had about 20 years, has bloomed about every other year for that period of time. So if you want a yucca that's going to bloom repeatedly, then yucca shadigara is the one to go for. I also have a, a little fishhook cactus, Mammillaria dioica, which uh, just blooms like crazy. Um, unfortunately, I put it in a bad spot, bad for me, good for the cactus, but bad for me because I can't see it most of the time it's hard to get to, but uh, still it seems to be very happy there. So I'm leaving it. A really great plant for any native plant garden is coast buckwheat, Areogonum fasciculatum. Um, I just had to include a photo here with this little butterfly on it because if you do have buckwheat, you are going to have tons of insects, bees, butterflies, all kinds of things. And, and those are the things that I want to attract to my garden. I, I want the garden to be for the plants themselves, but also for the critters that are going to share that space. This is one of my new favorites, Scarlet Delphinium or Delphinium cardinale. I first saw this in the Torrey Pines extension blooming and I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe this was a native, so I had to get some. I got this one from a nursery called uh, Annie's Annuals up in the Bay Area and they ship plants and they do a very good job of shipping plants down to us. And uh, so I, I got several of these. It took quite a few tries to get the right place for these, but now that I have them in the right place, they're producing tons of seedlings every year. Plus uh, the old plants, they die back to the ground, but then they come back again from the roots in the spring. 
So uh, I'm getting lots and lots of these delphiniums in, in one particular spot and they're spreading out of that spot now too. So that's a great one. Here's a really great chaparral plant uh, that I see a lot when I'm hiking, Circocarpus minutiflorus. And you can see here that it, it gets to be a large shrub or small tree, but uh, not very dense. It, it has a real see-through um, characteristic to it. Great flowers in the spring, like right about now, they're very fragrant, really nice flowers. Uh, I don't like to show this photo that shows the house next door, not that I have anything against it, but I'm trying to show you the more pretty pictures, but I wanted to show this because this Circocarpus could be used as a screen if you have several of them in a row. If you don't want a dense screen uh, and you don't want something that gets too big, I know a lot of people that use they try to use bamboo as a screen and then they find, end up fighting bamboo forever after. Another one of my favorites, uh, Delmar Manzanita. And this one is a favorite because I didn't buy it. I rescued it from a proposed uh, apartment site in Carlsbad just before the bulldozers came in. And I dug up quite a few little seedlings. And uh, this is the only one that survived, but it has survived nearly 30 years now. And uh, it's a great bloomer. Um, it just really, it looks good all the time. Uh, it really is a coastal species. So if you're looking for a manzanita, if you live inland, uh, Ramona or um, Poway, you know, this may not be the right one for you. And when I say the right one, I mean this particular subspecies because Arctostaphylus glandulosa in general is called Eastwood's manzanita, and that is found all over the county. But this subspecies, Crassifolia, is really confined to a little strip between Torrey Pines and Carlsbad. And uh, so if you're all along the coast in there anywhere, this would be a great subspecies to, to have in your garden to try to keep that rare species going. Another manzanita that we have is Mission Manzanita, Xylococcus bicolor. And uh, it's really interesting to me that this has been put into its own genus, Xylococcus, rather than the other Manzanitas are all in Arctostaphylus. I don't know why that is, but this is a really nice, nice Manzanita. Um, I have a couple of them. One of them I bought, I can't remember where I bought it, but the other one I bought at the uh, CNPS plant sale it was propagated by Lee Gordon. So that one is coming along really well now. And if you're interested in this plant, you can almost always get it at the CNPS plant sale. Here's a couple of uh, fairly new ones that I've installed in the last five or so years. Uh, Ceanothus tomentosus is, that's the blue flowering wild lilac that has for the last couple of weeks at least has been blooming all over the hills and uh, canyons of San Diego County. Um, Berberus nevinii or Nevin's barberry is a rare species that is very rarely seen. And uh, so I, uh, I can't say too much more about it because I actually don't know a lot about it, but it's a gorgeous plant and I love it. The only thing I have to say about it is that all the Berberus, as far as I know, are very, very prickly. The leaves are uh, they have points all over them. So you got to be careful again where you plant that. Make sure it's in a place where it's not going to be annoying you all the time. This is a plant that I, I really like because it's so different from all my other plants. It's Western thistle or also called cobwebby thistle, Circium occidentale. And, uh, and this is our one native thistle. There are a lot of thistles out there in the backcountry. Uh, that are non-native. There's Italian thistle and bull thistle and I don't know what else, but this is our native. And uh, sometimes it's hard to tell them apart, but I think you can identify this one by the really cobwebby hairs that are in the flower head. These are flower heads here that are getting ready to open up. And um, so it's a really nice plant if you just want uh, something different and an accent uh, going along with your other shrubs. The one thing you need to be careful about with this one, aside from the fact that it's very prickly, um, if you leave all these flower heads on there to go to seed and just let them scatter around your garden, then pretty soon 
you're going to have way too many of these and then you're going to have to pull some out. So just be careful about how far you let the seeds spread. Now I have a whole bunch of annuals and herbaceous perennials that I just want to briefly mention. Herbaceous perennials means that they die back to the roots in the, the, uh, in the summer, basically. And then in the fall or winter, when we get rain, they come back to life again. Annuals, of course, uh, they come up from seed and uh, each year, and then they bloom and the plant dies, but the seeds go back in the ground. So what I've got here uh, on the top row are woodland clarkia, a geranium species that I'm not sure what it is, uh, tidy tips, that's the yellow one with the white tips, California fuchsia, and then the bottom row is uh, wishbone bush, then blue-eyed grass, baby blue eyes, and finally arroyo lupin. So those are scattered all around the, the uh, garden, kind of in between the perennial shrubs. I also have a number of things in containers. I like unusual containers like this rusty bucket. And so I have a bunch of Chinese houses, Kalinzia heterophylla in there. And here's some other containers on the left. Uh, this container has a Dudley uh, lanceolata and some uh, golden stars, Blumeria crocea growing in it. And then the one on the, the right shows uh, different Dudleyas that I have. And then there are some geophytes. I love geophytes. Geophytes are plants that have a bulb, corm, tuber, something like that, that grows underground. So uh, these four are, let me see now, Brodea filifolia, which is a very rare species. Blumeria crocea, that's the golden star. Uh, Dipterostemon capitatum, which we used to call blue dicks, and now people seem to be calling it blue dips to go with the new botanical name. And finally, Allium hematochaitan, which is a red-skinned onion. Now let's move on to the Channel Islands section. I particularly wanted to have a Channel Islands section because I grew up in Ventura County where I could look out almost every day and see the Channel Islands out there on the horizon. So first to anchor the Channel Islands section, I have a Santa Cruz Island ironwood, Lionothamnus floribundus subspecies Esplenifolius. And the reason I'm uh, giving the subspecies here is because a lot of people refer to this tree as Catalina ironwood, but this is not Catalina ironwood, this is Santa Cruz Island ironwood. Catalina ironwood is a different subspecies that has different leaves on it. So this one has uh, ferny-like leaves. That's what the subspecies name Esplenifolius means. Uh, has really great flowers. Those leaves, when they fall off, make really great mulch. And then underneath that tree, I have Nevin's woolly sunflower, Constancia nevinii, uh, which is um, it has this gray, very gray foliage, yellow flowers in the spring. It seems to attract a lot of insects. Um, this one spreads by, by uh, runners or um, what do you call those? Uh, well, anyway, it spreads underground. Uh, and so it will spread to take over adjacent areas. So if you plant it, keep in mind uh, how far you're going to let it spread and be prepared to contain it. Another great one from the Channel Islands is the island bush poppy, Dendromecon harfordii. This gets to be pretty tall. Um, the one that I have here in this picture is um, maybe three to five years old, so it's not full size yet, but it is producing abundant flowers right now. And so this is a really terrific plant. Um, if you're especially looking for a Channel Islands plant, there's also a Dendromecon that's, that uh, is found on the mainland and that's Dendromecon rigida. It looks a little different. I like the looks of this one better. Yeah, I've had both and uh, I, I prefer to stick with this one, but you may want rigida if you want a more authentic San Diego version. Island alum root, Euchara maxima. This is one of the, the uh, most common Euchara species that's sold in nurseries, has great little cream or pink colored flowers. 
Uh, this is a shade lover. Uh, it likes to be a little more damp than other plants, so keep that in mind if you're going to plant that. Now, this thing in the photo on the left, in case you can't recognize what that is, that is a silvery legless lizard. And I'm not making this up. This is really a lizard that has no legs. It lives underground. It's a uh, fairly common in, in Southern California. There are a few different subspecies. And I'm, I feel just really lucky to have so many of them in my yard. They seem to like the soil here. And so in, in this picture that I, on the left here, I got that when I was just picking up some leaf litter, just moving it out of the way. And there it was right underneath there. So I was able to get this picture before it crawled back underground. Here's another island, Great One, Santa Rosa Island Sage or Salvia brandigii, named after the, the famous botanist Kate Brandigi. This is very, very similar to black sage that is all over San Diego County. In fact, I couldn't really tell you what the difference is, but this is the, the island form and it produces beautiful pale blue flowers and it's just a really all around nice shrub. Wart stem ceanothus is a shrub that could be found either on the mainland here or on the Channel Islands. It's found in both places. This is a rare species uh, that uh, on the mainland, it's really uh, found just along the coast. Obviously white flowers, um, just another really great shrub. Island cherry is Prunus elicifolia lioni. This produces actual cherries that are actually edible, although they don't have much to them. They're mostly seed, but the native people of this region used to uh, take the seeds and grind them and uh, make a mush out of them, very similar to what they did with acorns. And it was, this seed was probably second only to acorns in terms of its importance as a, a food source. Really nice plant. It does become a tree uh, eventually. I've seen them, um, 30, 40 feet tall. I mean, they can get really big. This is an unusual one that most people probably have not seen, Blair's wire lettuce. I got this from uh, Tree, of Knife, Tree of Life Nursery. And uh, I don't have a photo of the, the flowers, but it has tiny little pink flowers in a, in a big cluster. But the thing that's most striking about this plant is the broad leaves that stay green like this all year long. It has somewhat succulent stems, which I think uh, contain water to help, help the plant make it through the summer. A really uh, unusual and different one. Okay, now moving on to section four, which is the pond habitat. I always wanted to have a pond. So when we got to this house, I created my first pond, but it was too small and too shallow. And the raccoons would get in it every night and just tear it up. So I had to make a bigger pond. And my thinking about this, the bigger pond was that I wanted to make it a pond for uh, native plants. But I found out afterwards how difficult it is to find native aquatic plants for sale. It's very, very difficult. So the main one I have is this marsh purslane, Ludwigia peploides peploides, except I'm not sure that it really is peploides subspecies. Uh, when you buy plants like this, they, the people that sell them often don't really know exactly what they have. So I'm not sure if I have the native one or not, but it's doing very well in my pond and the dragonflies seem to really love it. This dragonfly on the right, which was a very large dragonfly, uh, that's a female laying eggs in the pond. So they've been laying eggs for a number of years now and and just have generation after generation of dragonflies. I also brought in a few tadpoles one time and they turned into frogs as they do. And they, uh, they're they nice to have, but if you're thinking about having frogs, you need to keep in mind that they do croak at night and they can make a lot of noise. Dragonflies, on the other hand, they're very quiet and peaceful. But the, the frogs, I mean, I, I really am of two minds about them. I really love them, but they can make a lot of noise. So just keep that in mind. A couple of other uh, wetland plants that are often found near streams or seeps or ponds. 
we have the seep monkey flower and the scarlet monkey flower. Both of these used to be in the genus Mimulus, but somebody thought it was a good idea to move them into Erythranthi, which uh, to me sounds like a horrible name. But uh, they're both really great plants. They like more water than most other plants. They're really bog type plants. And so I have them in a container so I can give them as much water as they want. And uh, so I have that a, a container next to the pond. And I have a few other plants around the pond, but what I wanna mention here just briefly is the non-botanical elements of the pond area. Our home came with a nine foot high concrete block retaining wall on the back property line. And so one of the first things we thought of was how can we cover up or disguise this retaining wall? We finally came up with this idea to put a false facade on there to make it look like buildings and the, the style that we were kind of going for there is uh, Southern California of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, especially along Highway 101. Uh, then the, the larger shrub or small tree that's uh, up there in the middle, that is narrow leaf willow. I wanted to have a willow next to the pond, but I didn't want a willow that would get too big. So this one, Salix exigua, is I believe the smallest of the willows and it does real nicely there. Now finally the shade section. This is on the north side of the house where it's not shaded all the time but it's got part shade some of every day uh, it, through all seasons. So obviously this is going to be a great place for ferns. I have a western chain fern. I have a couple of these, Woodwardia fimbriata. Really just a beautiful fern. Mine tend to die back and disappear in the summer and then they come back in the fall or winter when we get rain. That may not be true for everybody. Um, I think this happens because uh, I'm kind of stingy with water, especially in the summer. So if you watered them continuously, I think you might be able to keep them green year round. And then this fern, leather fern, is not from Southern California at all. Uh, it is from Northern California, kind of the redwood zone from Monterey northwards, where it grows on fallen logs and stumps. Um, but I saw it at a nursery and I, I just had to have it. Uh, and especially finding out that it, it is a native to California. And so I planted it next to this old cypress stump um, that I, I wasn't able to get rid of it. So now I'm kind of disguising the stump with the ferns. And this is a very nice uh, example of a, a small fern, well-contained. It does spread itself slowly, but it, it doesn't get out of hand. Uh, then I have also in the shade area, a golden current, Ribes aureum. Uh, this thing on the right, that is a, a mushroom, a type of mushroom. It's in the genus Pisolithus. And it's uh, the strangest looking thing, but obviously it's an indication that there is fungus in the soil, but this is a good fungus. This is a, a fungus that everybody should want to have. And so I was very happy to see these mushrooms come up, um, even though they're very odd looking. And sometimes people think that they don't know what it is and they think just a great big dog pooped on their garden, but it really is a, a great thing to have. And it's an indication that you have very healthy soil. Also in the shade area is some yarrow, Achillea millifolium, very nice flowers in the spring. Um, it's another one that can die back uh, if it gets very, very dry and then it will come back afterwards uh, as soon as we get rain. And then last but not least is stinky syncofoil, which uh, is Drymocallus glandulosa. It used to be in the genus Potentilla, but once again, somebody decided that was too nice of a name, so they changed it to Drymocallus. This is a really nice one for a moist shade garden. It, uh, it does like a little more moisture. All of the shade ones like a little more moisture, but uh, having the, just having them in shade will help. And it has very nice flowers. You might notice that the leaves look a little bit like strawberry leaves because they are pretty closely related. So that's my garden in five parts. I have a blog that's down here at the bottom, encinitasnatives.blogspot.com. If you want to see my slides, I'm gonna be posting all my slides on there later. 
uh, probably starting later tonight. Uh, I probably won't get them on all at once, but they will be there if you don't want to watch the video and uh, listen to me over again. If you just want to look at the slides, then you can look at them there. And then you can also, if you look at the older posts on the blog, because I haven't blogged much lately, but the older ones will show more of the evolution of the garden and some of my earlier thinking and earlier attempts. So that's it for me. Any questions now? Yes, Don, thank you so much for your presentation. We have a few questions that came in. Okay. Um, one general one is, do you have any issue with issues with bugs such as those invasive ants? Um, I don't really have much of a problem with uh, bugs in general, but those ants, the Argentine ants are a problem for everybody everywhere. They're very, very difficult to get rid of. Um, even if you extirpate them from your garden, your neighbors will have them. And so they'll just come right back in. So um, Greg Rubin has some great ideas about how to combat them, but uh, to some extent you have to just learn to, to control them or, um, I mean, you can't really get rid of them. I think they're here to stay and you have to just figure out a way to manage them. Okay. Um, another general question is how large is your lot? Uh, my lot is about 7,500 square feet. And so the, the house and so on probably takes up about 2,500. So the garden part is maybe 5,000 square feet, roughly. And getting back to um, annoying <clears throat> things, do you have any problems with gophers? I've been really lucky uh, to not have any problems with gophers. I know that, that they have been in the neighborhood from time to time uh, and other people do trap them. And many, many years ago, back in the 90s, I did have a couple that I was able to trap and get rid of. But as a rule, I have not had gopher problems. What about um, squirrels or rabbits eating any new seedlings? If I had rabbits, I would be the happiest person on earth. But we don't really have rabbits here. Uh, I mean, once or twice, a baby rabbit that I think was really lost has showed up in our yard, but they don't last long. I don't know what happens to them, but they're just not around long. And squirrels are, uh, that's, that problem is similar to gophers. I know they're around, but I haven't had a problem with them here. Other people have had problems and, and it may have to do with how wet a garden is. They may be more attracted to uh, soil that's kept more continuously damp. My soil is kept pretty continuously dry except in the rainy season. Okay, excellent. What about skunks? <laughs> People uh, are really interested in those uh, in those critters. Well, the the skunks, Lucadia. Uh, I'm in the Lucadia neighborhood of Vincennes. Lucadia is famous for its skunks. They're they're just all over, and they wander through the yard. They sometimes dig little holes in the ground, and they stick their snouts in there, and they're looking for something. And but they don't do a lot of damage. They're they're not. Yeah, they're not really destructive animals. Okay. Um, going back to your Baja section, um, yes. how did you come into the Baja species? Did you go there and buy them or do you have a connection here? Well, as far as inspiration, it was from going there and uh, camping in Baja and seeing them. But then uh, I had to find ways to buy them here. So uh, one was this nursery that used to be in Encinitas, where Janine DeHart had a number of Baja species that nobody else had, like the Euphorbia xanti. And, and then others I've gotten by uh, mail order from, from nurseries from other places. For instance, there's a nursery in uh, Mesa, Arizona. I think it's called Mesa, Mesa Gardens. And that is a, uh, a, a nursery where I bought a number of Baja species uh, I bought the uh, Baja hedgehog cactus there. And um, they typically 
sell stuff that they can ship bare root. So they remove all the soil from it. It has to go through this uh, Arizona um, horticultural control system. And so they have to remove all the dirt from it and, and then they can ship it to you. And, um, and so that's another source. And, and then uh, Tree of Life Nursery, Mike Evans from Tree of Life also loves Baja species and he propagates some from time to time. So it, it really is uh, worthwhile to go to Tree of Life and go take a look at their uh, sort of desert section of their nursery. They have a lot of great stuff there. Excellent. Um, also, Catherine is asking, how did you get the Cedros Dudlia? Well, that was interesting because I got it from uh, uh, Anderson's Lacosta Nursery, which is a, a retail nursery right in my neighborhood. And they have some natives and some succulents that they get from other suppliers. And so this one, when I bought it, I didn't even know what it was. I mean, it had the name on it, but that didn't mean anything to me. But I liked the look of it, so I bought it. I brought it home and I looked in the Baja plant field guide and discovered that it was from Cedros Island. So I went back to the nursery and asked them where they got it. And, and they really, uh, I, I think they told me where, who, who their supplier was, but they said that it, um, they, they don't produce a lot of these. And so it's not something that they have in stock often. So you, you have to shop around and look for people that have them when they have them. I think I just got lucky and found that one when it was there before somebody else bought it. But another source for plants like that, now I wouldn't say they have that one exactly, but Grigsby Cactus Nursery in Vista has a whole bunch of different native and non-native succulents. You need to go through their, um, their online list and see what they have and their, their stock, what they have ready to sell is changing all the time. So you got to keep a close eye on it. And if there's something that looks interest, interesting to you, then you got to get down there and grab it while they have it. So for instance, the, uh, the Dudley uh, Candida I got from Grigsby's. Okay, thank you. Um, what is your watering protocol during the summer? I don't like to water too much during the summer, but um, but some plants do need it. The, the plants on the in the shade garden need it more than the rest. So I will typically water them with a hose about once a week. And so the, the purpose there, and this is something that I, I got from Mike Evans from Tree of Life, that summer watering is not intended to keep uh, the plants looking good. It's really just, it's to keep them alive, to, to help them survive the drought of the summer. So I, I, don't, uh, I don't water them with the point of view that they're, they're going to suddenly perk up and look like they did in the spring. The idea is just to keep them going along until the rains come. So that's the, as far as the shade garden, I hand water there. And then I also have a special watering system for the oak tree in the front. I, I have a, a system, it's uh, too hard to describe, but it's a subterranean watering system because with oaks, you wanna get the water down below the top foot or so of soil where it's the warmest. You want to get it down in the root zone where uh, it's typically around 55 degrees all year round uh, down there in the root zone. And the reason for that is in the warm soil in the, in the top foot or so of soil, uh, that's where the, the, the garden pathogens are going to live. And if they have wet soil or even just damp soil, they're going to have a population explosion and possibly kill your plant. So you got to get the, the water down to the roots somehow. But that's a whole other topic. Um, so uh, since you're talking about kind of the shade area, do you keep that dry except for when it rains, the top part of it then? or? Yeah, I, I don't keep it totally dry. Uh, so that's the, the purpose of the weekly watering is to to keep it just moist enough so that the plants are okay 
Uh, but most of these plants are, are used to having a summer drought anyway, as long as they don't get too hot and as long as they don't have direct sun. So they're, they're, if they have evolved to kind of hunker down for the summer and just take it easy and wait for more water to come and then they can really uh, do their thing. Okay. Uh, any rules of thumb for choosing natives for containers? Uh, rules of thumb. I don't know. I, I, I think uh, the rules of thumb that I can think of would be the, the obvious ones like uh, don't put something in a container if it's ultimately going to become a big shrub, except that I violated that rule myself and it worked out so far. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to, to say a rule of thumb, but if you look at the, some of the websites like Musa Creek's website, they have a, a search feature where you can, uh, you can ask for a list of plants that are good in containers. And I think their list is pretty good. And I would just go by that. Okay. Uh, some people have some questions about your pond. Um, okay. Judy actually is wondering um, what type of frogs do you have? Okay, well, first of all, I have to say I feel very badly about this because I owe Judy a frog. And I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, Judy, I'm going to get you frog someday. Uh, but I can't say when. But the kind of frog I have is the, it's called the Pacific Chorus Frog. And it's the, the very typical, the most common frog we have in streams and ponds. And it's the one that, uh, that goes ribbit, ribbit. It's a very small frog. They're only a couple of inches long, but they have a, a voice that, uh, well, all I can say is all my neighbors know that I have frogs. Do you have to add water to your pond much or can you rely totally on rainfall? I can't rely totally on rainfall to keep it full. So I do add water to it sometimes, but I also uh, collect shower warm up water and I, I use that sometimes to refill the pond or to water some of the plants. So uh, it, my water usage in general is very, very low, um, but the pond does have to have some water added to it periodically if you wanna keep it full, but you don't have to keep it full either. I mean, if you wanna be really natural, you can let the pond uh, just shrink down in size over the summer. The frogs won't really care and uh, even the plants won't really care. But if you want a good looking pond, you want it to be more full. And Jan is wondering, what does seep mean? I saw that word associated with another plant she just ordered. Yeah, a seep is like a spring, but it's, it's where the amount of water coming out is, is very minimal, minimal. So it's, the water is just kind of seeping out of a rock formation or something like that. And when you have that, there are certain plants that really thrive in a seep condition because the water around there is continually moist. Okay. Let me Does just... that make sense? Kind of, it made sense to me, hopefully. Okay. Maybe yeah. she'll yeah. Uh, let yeah. us know yeah. if she needs more. Um, yeah. Somebody else is wondering, um, in choosing plants, how should the gardener take into account global warming trends? Well, this is really interesting as it relates to Baja because I believe that what's going to happen over say the next 50 years is that some of the plants that we have been very used to here for, for millennia are, are not gonna be able to hold on uh, due to global warming. And so they will either uh, migrate to, to higher latitudes or to higher elevations. Um, but then plants from Baja may become more suitable here, more appropriate. And I, I, I do think that's something we're going to see more of in the future. Plants that um, can get by in, under hotter conditions and with less water. I think we're going to see more and more of them here. 
Excellent. Uh, <laughs> getting back to um, natives in containers, what kind of soil do you use? Most of the time I just use the soil that I have here, which is, uh, it's very sandy. It's, it's crumbled up sandstone. The bluffs here are, are all, uh, they're old, um, oh, they're, they're just old marine terraces made out of sandstone. And so uh, I, I mostly just use that. Okay. And when you first plant natives, do you baby it with more water in the beginning until it's established? And also, how can you tell when it's established? Okay, well, that, that is a very important point because I have killed a lot of plants by not watering them enough in the beginning. So in, in the first year, uh, I've found that it, it's necessary to really give new plants a lot of water. And, um, and even in the summer, uh, I think, uh, so that goes against my normal rule, but I think new plants have to be uh, considered differently. But you can tell when they're established, when you start backing off the watering, the, uh, the non-rain watering, you start backing that off and, and they still look good. Then you know you can back off pretty much all the way. Excellent. Thank you so much, Don, for sharing your You're amazing sick. photos and excellent advice. Uh, this is especially great for us newbies because I feel like you've given us a glimpse into our future, maybe, if, we're, if we do everything okay. I hope so. so yes, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, you. Now, Judy Lintzer, who is the CNPS Native Plant Garden Committee co-chair, is going to talk um, briefly about their goings on. Judy, are you there? Yes, uh, I'm here. Okay, so um, thanks again, Don, so much. It was great to um, hear from you and see your wonderful pictures. And uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just going to go over what we do with the Native Garden Committee. And um, if people are interested in getting involved, I'll give you some information on that as well. So um, first, there are three co-directors. Um, it's myself, um, Christine Hoey, and Nancy Levine. And the Native Garden Committee mission is to inspire more people to bring California natives to their landscapes to create habitat for birds and pollinators and create a water-wise garden. Um, so during COVID, we've offered educational Zoom presentations every other month. And we have an active group that contributes monthly how-to articles on California native gardening and projects and more. And we're actually looking for more articles. So if any of you um, are interested in writing articles or might have some articles on native plants, um, we would love you to send them to us. And I'll give you our um, email address right now and I'll remind you at the end. So it's nativegardening at cnpssd.org. Um, so yes, we would love to hear from you. Um, another thing that I wanted to tell you about is Christine Hoy has been working tirelessly, like just so much on putting together, put to, putting together an upcoming 360 virtual garden tour. It's going to be posted on the CNPS SD website this Saturday. And um, again, it's done in a top-notch format. Um, we're featuring five gardens that were supposed to be on the canceled tour from last year. And uh, one of the gardens is actually my garden. So you'll see a little bit of the pool to pond and then four other gardens as well. So it will include garden owner videos, plant IDs and much more. So please um, take a look at that. Um, also, we're working in Balboa Park um, at the Bird Park section, which is on 28th Street, just south of Upas. Uh, we have plans, we're getting a final plant list and we're looking at forming some small in-person work groups for planting natives at Bird Park. So we would love novices and experienced native gardeners. Uh, we welcome everyone. And to sign up for the work group, please contact us at nativegardening at cnpssd.org. Um, so many of us have been indoors and at home and kind of like twiddling our thumbs and really anxious to get out there. So that would be a wonderful opportunity. Um, another thing we have going on is at Balboa Park, the Zuro Garden. Um, Lee Gordon oversees that and we do garden maintenance every month or two um, on an as needed basis. So if you're interested in helping out with that, 
again, please email us at the Native Gardens at CNPSSD. Uh, we're not sure when we're going to be able to resume our upcoming in-person meetings. Um, they are usually outdoors anyway. Uh, we used to do them every month. We are famous for our potlucks. Um, it's very social. You get to view a different per person's garden every month, and then we discuss our upcoming projects. Um, so anyway, it's uh, really been incredibly enjoyable having those meetings. We'll, we'll let you know when we're going to be starting them up again. Um, our next presentation will be May 11th, and um, it's a Native Garden Committee Zoom meeting. It's from 8.30, I'm sorry, from 6.30 to 8 p.m. And the presentation is called Regenerative Landscapes and Climate Adaptations. So we have Sean Mastretti, landscape architect and principal of Studio Petrichor and Lee Adams, um, consultant and educator. So it's a continuing conversation from David Newsom's March presentation. They'll be talking about hugel culture and much more. So embracing real life solutions accessible to homeowner, homeowners and garden enthusiasts, communities, landscape professionals, and it's timely and informative. So please look into tuning into that. Um, only 100 participants can participate, um, but it will be recorded. So please, if you're interested, sign up for it and uh, register. Um, the registration would be at cnpssd.org slash events. You can find this information on our websites. And again, if you're um, interested in getting our emails for the Native Garden Committee, please get on the Native Gardening um, email as well, and then we can send you some more information. So we look forward to more people getting involved and we'll let everyone know when the in-person meetings are coming up. And that's all from me and the Native Garden Committee. Thank you from, again, Judy, that's me, and Christine and Nancy. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, thank you very much, Judy. Sounds like there's a lot of good things that should be happening soon, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Don, for showing us your lovely garden. Uh, thank you also to Joseph Sokor and Tori Neal, who uh, planned all these webinar events for Native Plant Week. And I hope everybody has an enjoyable evening. Bye. Thank you.